I'm Drew Stevenson, and in this video, I want to talk about two competing theories of the administrative state or of uh, regulatory law generally. And this is a big picture sort of introduction to administrative law and regulation, both for my administrative law class and for my statutory interpretation and regulation class. And what we're going to be talking about here is really a traditional prevailing view for a long, for a long, long time about why we regulate and why is regulation necessary and justified in some cases, and then sort of a modern uh, counter view or, or contrasting view to that, that has really taken hold in academia and with some judges and so forth. So uh, this isn't going to be a long video. I just want to compare and contrast about a few ideas here. And again, I'm going to call this public choice theory for the new view or the modern view, because that's what's showing up on case books, like the one I have pictured here, um, and uh, public choice theory. You may, as we go through this, think that I'm really just talking about libertarianism or an anti-regulation viewpoint or um, classic free market economics, or depending on your law school, you may call this the neoliberal view. So public choice theory, what I'm going I'm to call it that, and you can call it other things if you want, but that's sort of one of the monikers that is called on in academia, is a modern academic idea that views regulation and actually the entire administrative state as the product of special interest groups using government power to support their interests beyond what they could otherwise achieve in a truly free market or, or in the, the wild, so to speak. Um, this, by the way, this is an old Norman Rockwell picture of the um, getting a marriage license at a local clerk's office or county clerk's office. Um, so this viewpoint sees the government officials and regulations themselves, uh, regulators themselves, I'm sorry, as a special interest group of its own that's seeking to increase their own power and maximize their own benefits from the regulatory regime. And so traditionally, we just looked at, do we need regulations? And then we assumed that the people we put into government would be faithfully acting in the public interest. But the, this group of um, political scientists and economists and other people who have advocated this view really think that regulators sometimes have their own personal agenda and are their own self-interest that we need to be aware of and that courts need to be aware of when we're looking at what their actions uh, at their actions in court and in litigation. So this new theory assumes that each party involved in administrative law is pursuing self-interested goals rather than having altruistic motives or seeking the public good. Now, the traditional view um, assumed that politicians and administrative agencies acted in the public interest to the best of their abilities. And this traditional view assumed that agencies acted in the public interest. And so there was little thought given to the motivations driving the individuals and groups that were actually in, that were the regulators themselves. And now the traditional view of regulators focused on four main justifications for regulation. The problem of externalities, the problem of monopolies, the problem of public goods, also called a tragedy, the commons, and the problem of information costs. And so, in other words, the view was even if you believed in the free market and that people, things will take care of themselves if you just leave people alone and give them freedom, the idea was that there are times where the system breaks down or where we have market failures. And those are these four types of, we could put all of those market failures in one of these four types of categories, Exter externalized costs or externalities, monopolies, the problem of public goods and the problem of information costs or we sometimes call information asymmetries. So public choice theory gives a counter argument for each of these traditional justifications for regulation, asserting that these are really just a smokescreen for special interest groups to dominate others. This is an old um, engraving by William Hogarth about the Undertaker's um, Club in, the, the, in his day. Okay, so let's talk about externalities first. I have an old, uh, another old engraving of a musician being tormented by a racket outside of his house. 
right? So externalities are costs or benefits, like they can be, from certain activity that are foisted on innocent third parties. And this could be noise, right? So you want to blast your music um, in your backyard at three in the morning or practice your drum set in your garage at three in the morning and it bothers your neighbors. And that's an externality. They have to, that's a, that's a cost to them um, that is a nuisance, right? So nuisances are a classic externality. Pollution, the risks of infection. So you know that you have been infected with a deadly disease um, that other people can catch and you don't care. You go ahead and get on an airplane and eat at restaurants and spread it to other people. And um, sort of, and so they incur a cost because you can't um, bother to be inconvenienced to protect the legal interests of others. And so a traditional rationale for government regulation was to address these problems of externalities, right? That people have a perverse incentive to dump pollution in the river so it ends up going to their neighbors or um, uh, to, to burn things and, and the, the smoke blows away and blows to the neighbors and so forth. And so the government traditionally would either prohibit certain activities that impose costs on others or regulating how and where and when they can occur. And so public choice theory counters that regulatory responses to externalities are just the interests of one group triumphing over the other by manipulating the bureaucracy, right? So this is a, the view that once the, you have a power structure in a bureaucracy in place, um, if somebody wants, whoever's better at taking control of that and manipulating it, working the system, so to speak, um, can just get what they want at the expense of others. Now, let's talk about the problem of monopolies and then the concentration of authority. The traditional view is that certain public services like electricity really couldn't be provided to the public by the free market. And so regulators would bestow a monopoly on a single service provider. So in the 20th century, or early 1900s, we did this with electricity. We did this with the water company. We did this with telephone service, where there was really basically one phone company and so on and so on. And then we would require that firm to provide you know, universal service to everyone and to charge customers affordable rates and so forth. So we would basically pick a company and the dominant or the the, the main carrier and say, okay, fine, you're, uh, uh, you have a monopoly and now we're going to regulate you. But part of the deal will be that you don't have to worry about new market entrants coming in and um, uh, competing with you. Uh, this is another picture of um, signing a, a marriage license, getting your marriage license at the county office. And, um, and so the idea was that sometimes we have to concentrate things like licensing and permitting and, and record keeping and so forth because private parties aren't going to provide an adequate system um, for that, for verifying that. And so now, and then lastly, we're going to talk about information costs and asymmetry. So when consumers have imperfect or incomplete information, like the crowds that used to gather around these snake oil salesmen, um, market failures can result. Competition fails to produce more efficiency or reflect consumer values and people can't protect themselves against fraud. Right? So you can sell something that's just a bottle of turpentine and tell people that it's going to heal all of their illnesses and people don't know any better or have any way of knowing any better. And maybe there's another product being sold across the street that actually um, would be much better and much safer, but how are most consumers supposed to know? And it would be very costly to um, get to the bottom of everything and find out everything and never be able to rely on what a label said or what a salesman said at all. And so obtaining information about products takes time and sometimes money, right? It's a huge waste of time. If you've ever made a major purchase, uh, shopped for cars, for example, and tried to do your homework before you even go to the car dealership, it can be overwhelming. It takes a lot of time. So many consumers just don't, right? And um, they just go and buy whatever looks shiny at the store. And so this idea provided a rationale for regulations that required food labeling, efficiency ratings on appliances and cars, um, the investment disclosures, right, from the uh, on securities, um, when people are buying investments that they're given a little prospectus that they can read so they know um, uh, some things about the company's financial stability and so forth. Um, now, public choice theory says 
Um, we already have information overload. In fact, we've forced everybody to give us so much information that we don't know what we're getting into anymore. And consumers end up paying for information they don't really want or need. And then it distracts them from noticing things uh, like Little Red Riding Hood here um, that they really should have been paying more attention to. So left alone though, the public choice theorists say, just let the free market produce the same amount of information, right? So um, Campbell's actually has an incentive to tell you what's in their soup and brag about um, how delicious it is and the high quality ingredients they use. And customers would buy products with the desired information on the label. But now instead, because we require labels, some businesses actually lobby the government to require more labeling just to force their competitors to disclose unfavorable facts or information about their products. And so sometimes um, we have uh, companies that actually want regulation just because they know it won't hurt them, it'll hurt their market competitors more than them. And so that's, they're not worried about protecting the public, they're worried about getting rid of the competition. Okay, that concludes our quick lecture about the kind of two theories, the traditional theory and the sort of new public choice theory or neoliberal view or something like that about oh, the problem uh, regulation and whether it's justified based on externalities and the problem of monopolies and information costs and other types of market failures like that.